So before we got the ad hoc working group within the Community Congress program up and running, there was already some action um, that the Every Life Foundation and many other stakeholders had been engaged on. So I just want to set the stage on where we are legislatively with COVID-19 response, and then we'll get into a bit more about the Community Congress Working Group that we've set up specifically to address these issues. And so three pieces of legislation have been signed into law by the President over the last month and a half, which have supported um, our public health infrastructure providers, um, all of the responders to this crisis, as well as tried to provide support for the indirect costs um, to small businesses and directly to individuals who have been affected by the economic costs of this. Um, and a fourth relief package is currently being discussed in Congress right now. It passed the Senate earlier this week and is expected to be voted on by the House today. Um, I don't believe it's been voted on yet, but if that passes the House as we expect it to, it will then go to the President for signature very soon. And so, um, Shannon, you can go to the next slide, and I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, who's going to talk a bit more about what we've been hearing specifically from the rare disease community. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everyone. This is Wendy Erler, and I've been privileged to help co-lead this um, COVID-19 task force that we put together very quickly with Every Life Foundation to really start to hone in on what are the questions, concerns, issues that we're hearing from our communities? And what are the learnings that we can take forward more broadly past COVID? Um, I think there are actually gonna be some wins from this nightmare. So we wanted to capitalize on knowing what those are and what um, process and steps we needed to put in place to really learn from this. So some of the barriers that have been uncovered is obviously people with um, rare diseases are at high risk of uh, all sorts of complications and they've been told to stay home to reduce their chances of contracting COVID. While this may reduce their chances of contacting, contracting COVID, it also reduces their chances of maintaining their continuity of care for their rare disease, starting with and including you know, all normal healthcare visits, regular visits, regular checkups, all the way through to a disease diagnostic process that someone might already be engaged in that suddenly come to a halt. And then the aspect of potentially wanting to participate in a clinical trial and not being able to screen. So those are some examples of the barriers of being told to stay home due to the risk of the virus. It, as I said, creates access barriers for clinical trials, but also to therapies. Patients really raise concerns about receiving their therapies. What we're hearing directly from the community is potential prescription access hurdles. So many um, patients are on plans where they can get um, 30 days worth of a drug or 90 days, and they're just worried about what the future might be with all of the shutdowns and that impacting downstream businesses. Concerns of supply chain disruption have been heard over many, many communities. Um, we're actually involved in preparing a webinar. I'll send the invites to Every Life Foundation and they can pass it around to everybody. With the, one of the topics, one of the speakers on the panel is going to specifically talk high level about manufacturing and supply chain and what sorts of redundancies are put in place so that every effort is made across the supply chain to ensure that patients not only receive their meds, but all of their ancillary supplies and all of the needs they might need for an infusion or other modes of um, treatment. Reimbursement challenges for home infusion came up almost immediately, and Every Life Foundation has done an incredible job of, ad, of advocating for home infusion. People also need education about home infusion, what to expect, what's the disruption, et cetera. Um, if you go on down through the list, one of the most important ones that hits home is the delivery system re restrictions, and that's impacting continuing, starting, even re readouts of data from clinical trials and other research all the way through newborn screening pilots. So work that had a lot of momentum and a lot of support behind it came to a screeching halt. Anti-kickback status, preventing companies from paying for home visit nurses to administer drugs that are usually administered in an office setting for federally funded patients. Um, this is something that, as I mentioned earlier, what we can learn from this and what we can take forward so that we can eliminate some of these restrictions when we go back to other ways of working. There's a lot of uncertainty around what is considered to be an elective procedure. I saw an article today that said, elective doesn't mean unnecessary. And for some reason that sentence just jumped out at me because for many people, elective surgery is critical and they're left now waiting to know if and when they'll be able to have a scheduled hip replacement or knee replacement, which means they're living in pain 
that they thought was going to be taken care of very soon and now the future is uncertain. Education around the essential nature of approved therapy delivery, this is coming up a lot, for example, in communities where patients are immunocompromised. So if their therapy puts them at risk for being immunocompromised, should they continue? Because then they feel they're at greater risk for the virus, but are they at greater risk if they discontinue their therapy? So all sorts of um, questions around that type of area. Questions about gaps in data collection and how that will be handled by industry and other sponsors of clinical research. So understanding if that will delay, slow down, or impact the ultimate outcome of the research. And then opportunities for telehealth, remote monitoring, and decentralized trials. This is one of the best examples of lessons that we could learn in the midst of having to work this way that hopefully we can take forward to really improve how we deliver on these initiatives later. And then the need to document COVID-19 mitigation strategies so that we're prepared going forward should something like this happen again and that we've understood how fast we can mobilize, what we need to have in place to mobilize, and how we can best serve our community. Next slide, please. So the, this one you, Steve, I'll, these aren't numbered anymore and I lost track. I think this one's me and then you. Um, so the membership for Community Congress at Every Life Foundation is a program dedicated to bringing over 200 patient organizations together, leaders from industry and manufacturing companies, and all other rare disease stakeholders. So that's a big bucket of cross-functional expertise, unique experiences that everyone brings to the table, and really bringing all these minds together to unearth questions, issues, have critical discussion topics, and then align and mobilize on steps forward. The Strategic Advisory Council piece is that we're designed to provide advice and insight on urgent policy issues and foundation programs and initiatives. And then there are four permanent working groups that work on self-selected projects to advance policy for rare disease patients and ad hoc working groups such as the COVID task force that was put together very quickly. The four working groups now are newborn screening, regulatory, public policy, and then access. The ad hoc working group on COVID-19 came together to really establish and examine challenges resulting from the pandemic and answering a lot of those questions that we were hearing from the community and where could we as an organized group through Every Life Foundation make recommendations to intervene and improve the situation. The ad hoc working group for this topic is open to all community Congress members and we welcome your participation and need your voice. We hope to reflect on all lessons learned from this crisis and then repurpose them to think forward, look around corners, identify solutions. We really want to be innovative and we want to extend the flexibility that we're seeing in some areas to our future ways of working and ways of serving patients. And most importantly, we really want to share and learn best practices from each other so that we can together continue those best practices and expand them. This is a temporary working group. Um, I, we're going to identify opportunities that can be brought back into the four permanent working groups that I just mentioned. We're having webinars on April 7th and April 22nd, where we do identify challenges that fall outside of the scope of these four work groups or extend beyond rare disease. We're really working hard to identify appropriate partners to connect with for potential leadership in that area. So no idea is gonna go unlistened to or unrecognized. We'll make sure we get it in the right hands if it doesn't fit in with the four working groups that are already established with Every Life Foundation. And I will hand over to Steve. Thank you very much, Wendy. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the co-chairs that we have um, within the ad hoc working group. With all of the four working groups that we have, each has co-chairs representing um, the patient advocacy organization membership, as well as the industry membership. And this is something that's very unique to Community Congress. I think that we have all of the companies in the space and all of the patient advocacy organizations in the space, all on the same calls at the same table discussing these issues. And you can see that Annie Kennedy and myself from our team at Every Life are representing the patient advocacy side of the co-chairs. And we have Wendy who just spoke, as well as Carolyn from Sarepta um, serving as co-chairs. Next slide. And so the ad hoc working group has really supported the foundation's advocacy work 
both at the state and federal level. And very early on, um, we were able to use the Community Congress infrastructure and membership and many of the patient organizations and companies that are probably on this call right now um, to get the word out about some uh, challenges that would be coming up, specifically on access for rare disease patients when it was being recommended that they stay at home. Um, there were definite issues in actually getting access to home infusion therapies or refilling prescriptions. And so we sent a letter out to all 50 states signed by nearly 200 patient advocacy organizations. Um, and we were pleased to see that we got really great responses from states that they were going to be tackling these issues, um, that maybe some that we brought to their attention that they were unaware of were now going to be elevated. And so we're going to continue to use the ad hoc working group um, to really get that message across at the state level. Next slide. And so we've also been identifying who has the authority to do what. And many times when it comes to these access issues, the states have flexibilities that they can exercise themselves, but it oftentimes comes down to CMS needing to make a change or Congress needing to make a statutory change. So the Community Congress Ad Hoc Working Group has been um, reaching out not only at the state level, but also at the federal level with Congress, CMS, um, and other agencies where it is important to let them know what challenges the patient community um, is facing. And we've been using the working group to hear what those challenges are, figure out what the policy solutions may be, and then communicate and advocate for those policy solutions to the federal government. We've seen a lot of great progress. A rule came out of CMS that makes it easier for patients to access home infusion services. Um, we also saw guidance come out of FDA in support of um, innovations for clinical trials to adapt to the current situation, as well as a recent rule that just came out of CMS, um, which really provides guidance on how a lot of the facilities that provide this type of care can, quote unquote, reopen and provide what is being considered non-emergent, non-COVID-19 healthcare, but for the rare disease patient population, we know is very important um, and often essential to receive in a timely manner. Um, next slide. And so the path forward um, we're going to continue to use this working group to try and address challenges to access clinical trials and newborn screening. And as Wendy mentioned, also identify where there are opportunities um, where we can improve access clinical trials and newborn screening with lessons learned from this crisis. Um, all of the, the dialogue that happens on the calls we've had two so far with this ad hoc working group um, is something that we then try to relay to the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus membership, as well as key federal agencies to keep them, in, them informed. And if there's certain challenges um, related to or resulting from COVID-19 that your patient community is facing, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know, um, as well as if you're identifying potential opportunities that we might be able to bring up in these ad hoc working groups. And if your organization is not already a community Congress member, please reach out to myself, Steve Silvestri, and my email is just s Silvestri at everylifefoundation.org. I'd be happy to tell you more about the Community Congress. It is something that individual patients, unfortunately, cannot join um, due to compliance issues with companies, but that patient organizations with a representative from that organization um, are welcome to join and happy to talk to people in more detail about that offline. And with that, I'm going to turn it over um, back to Shannon. Thanks, Steve. Do you know when the next uh, webinar for the working group will take place, or is that TBD? We have, it is TBD. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Steve and Wendy, so much. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah with the Partnership to Improve Patient Care. Sarah? Great. Thank you. And um, I hope, I think Maria Town is hopefully on as well. Um, Maria, are you able to speak up? Let me check, hold on. Okay, well, and I, I can go ahead and just introduce myself in the meantime. So my name is Sarah Van Gertrude, and I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership to Improve Patient Care. Um, as many of you, many of you probably already know, and I'm sure I think I've talked about before on an earlier call like this, um, our Chairman, Tony Coelho, um, was the original author of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so um, my purpose talking today is, is to just provide some information and background um, related to the really amazing work that is coming out of the disability community in this crisis to act um, and to really advocate for non-discrimination, um, particularly when it comes to um, the crisis standards of care that are coming out of various states that um, 
would provide guidance and 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 cases where there are um, shortages of medical care and and how they triage patients. Um, so as that Sarah, and, and, and needed Maria. So okay. She be able to Maria Town with the um, AAPD. Uh, Maria, I'll let you introduce yourself, but um, I'll give you all the boring information. But Maria is really the the person who is on the front lines and is doing a tremendous amount of at work on this directly with policymakers. So Maria, go ahead. Hi everyone. This is Maria Town. I'm the president and CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities. We are a Cross disability civil rights organization, and um, I, I just want to say thank you to all of you for all of your advocacy and for everything that you're doing to protect the rights of patients and disability uh, and people with disabilities during this time. Thank you. So I'll, I'll pause occasionally so Maria can chime in because she has a lot of the real time information that's happening. Um, so just as as a quick background. Um, and some of you may already be familiar with this, but some of the commonly referenced civil rights laws that are being referenced in this crisis are Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act and Section 504 of the Rehab Act, which both prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability in any HHS funded health programs or activities. In addition to that, as you all know, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act under Section 504 um, are the the Americans with Disabilities Act also has um, requirements for, for reasonable accommodations. And so we are, um, we're focusing on, on a lot of those different statutory um, guidances or statutes in this crisis to make sure that states understand that they are still in effect. Next slide. So the challenge, you know, specific to this crisis, um, the challenge that we're we're having is with what's called stand, crisis standard of care plans. Um, they're called different things in different states, but that's basically what they are. Those plans then inform providers how to make decisions on the allocation and reallocation of scarce medical resources. So early in the crisis, I think the first state that really triggered people's concerns was Washington State. Um, that was one of the first complaints that was filed by the advocacy community um, looking to mitigate Washington State from issuing a rationing plan that would, quote unquote, assess factors such as age, health, and likelihood of survival in determining who will get access to full care and who will be merely provided comfort care with the expectation that they will die. Um, in Alabama, um, and this one, thankfully, was actually resolved because the Office for Civil Rights um, implemented some enforcement, but the Alabama complaint um, actually was one of the most egregious, I think. Um, it called out its emergency operations plan for ventilator rationing where hospitals were ordered, quote unquote, not to offer mechanical ventilator support for patients with severe or profound mental retardation, moderate to severe dementia, and, some, and severe traumatic brain injury. And the policy applied to children, which I think was an, an, another very egregious component. So as I understand, Alabama has withdrawn that policy responding to OCR enforcement. Um, in Kansas, the third complaint um, went into, in the event of scarce resources, uh, individuals who use ventilators on a regular basis or who require acute care may have their ventilators removed and reallocated. Um, to other people if they quote unquote fail to meet criteria. So I think for particularly, I'm sure for, for the rare disease community, you know, if you think about somebody who has a ventilator that they use on a regular basis at home, um, the idea that that could be taken away from them is very scary. Um, and similarly in, in Pennsylvania, um, they, they had initially proposed to have uh, an explicit use of quote unquote comorbid diagnoses, pre-existing conditions that are disabilities to assess a patient's priority scores. They were trying to use what they would, were calling something evidence-based by creating a priority score. Um, and that also included certain elements that would be discriminatory against people with disabilities. And those guidelines, as I understand, have also been re revised because of Office for Civil Rights Enforcement. Um, and Maria, I thought you may, you may have some other examples or some other things to share at this point um, that, would that, that people will relate to. So this is Maria, Sarah, thank you so much for 
um, for that overview. I want to point out specifically in, um, in Pennsylvania, there has been, you know, some effort to resolve uh, the, the issues with their crisis standards of care, but it's even the revised version still presents some concern for people with disabilities or anyone with pre-existing health conditions um, as it still prioritizes care on the basis of long-term survivability. I think um, one, of, one of the things that is very concerning to me and why the disability has been, the disability community has been so concerned about the potential for discriminatory rationing is that these crisis standards of care plans actually existed long before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic began. And so many states have just, you know, dusted them off, pulled them off the shelf and begun to implement them. Uh, and so one of the drives behind our advocacy has been uh, the, the legal precedent that these crisis standards of care plans present. And one of our main messages that, you know, in a crisis, civil rights still exist and they still need to be enforced. Um, so I'm not sure if this is on the next slide, but I wanted to say that with, um, it, it's not. Okay, so after both the Washington State complaint and the um, Alabama complaint were issued, uh, and I think the New York complaint, the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights did issue a bulletin to states and healthcare systems reminding them of their civil rights obligations under the laws and regulations that Sarah mentioned earlier. And so the enforcement activities uh, that, that we discussed in both um, Alabama and in Pennsylvania were the result of that bulletin being issued. That's great. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Go ahead. And so, yeah, so, and I, just to back up a little bit too, I think one of the things that, that also, you know, a, a triggering factor in all of this as well, and I won't spend too much time on this, but some of you may have seen um, some early articles in this crisis from, I will, and I'll put quotes around it, bioethicists and people who call themselves experts, who are actually saying that we needed to have these kinds of rationing plans. And so, um, I think that was sort of a, a red flag that, that we needed to get organized in order to be responsive very quickly. Next slide. And so getting to um, a little bit of what Maria was talking about too, um, you know, Tony was very quick in response to a New York Times opinion piece um, that was advocating for rationing, um, did his own response, you know, and I think I like this quote, um, I did not fight for the Americans with Disabilities Act to let this country count people with disabilities as having less value than others. Those with underlying conditions should not allow self-appointed experts to instill fear. Um, and I, I think that sort of sums it up, at least from, from his perspective. Um, very soon after that, the National Council on Disabilities sent a letter in anticipation of all this to the Office, of, Office for Civil Rights essentially saying that they needed to give notice to physicians and hospitals um, that these laws are still in effect. And then um, there was right after that a bipartisan bicameral letter, um, which we were really excited to see, because as you know, that doesn't often happen in, in, this, in these days. Um, but there was a really strong bipartisan bicameral letter led by Jill Brandon Lankford over on the Senate side um, to the Office for Civil Rights urging them to provide guidance to states, reminding them of their obligation to adhere to these existing anti-discrimination laws. Um, and then that bulletin that, that Maria described came out, which um, we were really excited about. It's not, I think the, the distinction that you have to remember, and I've actually had, this has been a bit of an education for me as well. You have kind of a, if you think about it in terms of the range, it's, you know, you have a bulletin, then you have a guidance, then you have a, a rulemaking. Um, the bulletin has been really helpful, um, and, it, and, it, and based on that bulletin is how OCR is now then going after these states to, to do um, enforcement. There, has been, there have been letters that have been now sent over to OCR asking them to, to issue something that is a little bit stronger in the form of a guidance document. 
Um, and so a lot of the communications that you're seeing since then are pushing for a guidance document that might be a little bit stronger and, and, and provide more guidance to states about what, what is meant by non-discrimination. Um, and so there was another letter that was sent by senators um, on April 10th, and then most recently um, over 400 aging disability um, patient organizations sent a letter that um, are also urged the Office for Civil Rights um, to provide some guidance and noting that these, high, these particularly these hospital crisis standard, standard of care plans um, were still discriminating. Next slide. So in terms of next steps, and I think this is the part where we're, um, we're sort of in a, in a moment now where we're really looking to the Office for Civil Rights for, um, for their for leadership on, in terms of enforcement. Um, if you wanna follow the issue, Tony's been trying very hard to keep his Twitter account active on this issue so that any information is being shared um, quickly. So he, that's an easy way to follow the issue. Um, I'm also, the, the Center for Public Representation, which is one of the organizations that has been leading in terms of the disability law piece and filing the complaints, they have a really good website for, for following this. So you go to that website, you can see where all the complaints are being filed in various states. Um, and get an idea of sort of where this issue is in terms of state of play. Um, we would love for um, anyone to be sharing that letter that was signed by 430 plus advocacy organizations um, to be shared with your members of Congress. Um, I think at this point where we're waiting to see what OCR does with all this information before we decide whether we need to pursue, you know, whether, you know, some input from Congress or additional input from Congress over to the Office for Civil Rights or even legislation. Um, we're not sure yet whether that's necessary, um, but I think the next couple of weeks will be key. Um, and I don't know, Maria, if you have any updates too on how you think OCR is responding to all of this at this point. Sure, Sarah. So we have been uh, in touch with OCR and with the administration more broadly since sending the coalition letter um, that Sarah just described. And we've been doing um, a lot of education. You know, there, thankfully, um, there have not been many stories of rationing issues that have come out of the crisis. But the, the point that um, I've continued to make to policymakers is that if everyone who needed care was able to seek that care, whether it's individuals in nursing homes or group homes or other congregate settings, or um, you know individuals who are making a decision to stay at home because a hospital going to a hospital is such a risky choice, uh, we we may very well be seeing rationing, um, and also. This is the first time that every state in the nation has been under a, an emergency directive. Um, simply because we are all responding to a pandemic does not prevent a wildfire from starting or a hurricane from occurring on the Gulf Coast or other natural or man-made disasters from happening at the same time. And if we begin to experience major concurrent disasters, we will absolutely see um, a, a shortage on medical supplies and, um, and rationing to take place. So we've continued to push uh, the Office of Civil Rights to issue more firm guidance, potential, um, hopefully in the form of an interim final rule. Um, we also are you know, making sure that individuals know what their rights are and what they can be doing if they do choose to seek care in a, in a hospital to hopefully prevent any kind of discrimination from, from taking place. Um, I'll also say if, if you're interested in this issue, AAPD hosted a webinar on medical rationing and disability civil rights two weeks ago. Um, we had some of the leading legal minds in disability rights talking about what, um, what this all means, and you can find a recording and transcript of that webinar on AAPD's website, uh, which is aapd.com, and I can send the link to uh, Annie and Shannon to send out to all of you. 
um, I cannot stress enough the need to share stories. Um, and if you want to look at specific hashtags that the disability community is organizing around to amplify our messages, um, <clears throat> we are essential is one of the hashtags as well as uh, no box is disposable. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah and Maria. I appreciate you guys coming on to speak about this important issue. And if anyone has thank you for the opportunity for yeah, of course. If anyone has questions for Maria and Sarah, please feel free to email me, and I can um, put in contact with either or both of them. Um, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Dylan to discuss the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act. Great, thank you, Shannon. Uh, so just a little background first to get up to speed. Uh, so newborn screening is a public health program that tests uh, all babies within the first uh, two days of life uh, for a variety of conditions that can hinder normal development. Uh, newborn screening is extremely important because the early detection allows for early treatment, and the early treatment can help prevent intellectual and physical disabilities and life-threatening illnesses. Uh, what's also important in terms of a political question uh, is it not only saves lives, but it also saves costs to the overall healthcare system. Uh, by avoiding unnecessary costs uh, due to un due to untimely diagnosis, uh, as we all know, uh, this, the sooner that you can receive a diagnosis, uh, the earlier you can be in treatment. But it also gets rid of the diagnostic odyssey, uh, which will help to cut cut down on costs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a little bit of background on the federal RUSP. So the federal RUSP, or the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel. Uh, it's a list of disorders uh, that the Secretary of HHS recommends uh, for states to screen as part of their Universal Newborn Screening Program. Uh, it is important to note that states are the ones who ultimately decide uh, which, te uh, which disorders are on their newborn screening panels. Uh, the federal RUS is a recommendation uh, based on evidence that supports the potential net benefit of screening, uh, as well as the ability of states to screen for the disorder and the availability of effective treatment. Essentially, they want to make sure um, that if the, if these um, to add admission to the rust, they want to make sure that if a child is diagnosed with a disease, that they can actually get they can get the treatment they need, and to ensure that if they made this recommendation, that states are actually capable of adding it. Uh, so currently, there are 35 core conditions on the rust. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit of background on the New Orleans Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. Uh, it was passed originally in 2008. Uh, which established the National Newborn Screening Guidelines and helped facilitate comprehensive newborn screening in every state. Uh, it was first reauthorized in 2014. Uh, this was initially passed because prior to this act, uh, the number of quality of newborn screening tests varied greatly from state to state. As you can see, in 2007, uh, only 10 states in D.C. required infants to be screened for all the recommended disorders. Uh, today, uh, 50, all 50 states, as well as D.C., screen for at least 31 of the rest conditions, which with about 30, with about five or six currently screened for all 35, and that number is continuing to rise um, uh, on a yearly basis. We are seeing states uh, getting closer and closer to adding, um, having all 35 rest conditions on their state newborn screening panel, uh, such as this year, Indiana added one to make sure that they have, they are screened for all 35 rust conditions. So we are seeing that, um, that process of all states screening for all the rust conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit of information about the current uh, Reauthorization Act. So it was originally introduced um, last May um, by Representatives Robert Allard and Mike Simpson. Uh, the key bill provisions, uh, it would reauthorize the HRSA grants uh, that help to expand and improve their screening programs, as well as educate parents and healthcare providers, uh, and improve file conditions for these uh, detected conditions. Uh, in addition, it would reauthorize the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Heritable Disorders and Newborns uh, and Children, uh, or the Advisory Committee for short, uh, which provides the states with this recommended panel. So they, this is the Advisory Committee that reviews um, packages uh, of disorders to be added to the RUS and makes the final uh, nomination on whether or not it should be added to the federal RUS. Uh, in addition, uh, this bill would direct the National Academy of Medicine to conduct a study on how to modernize the newborn screening programs. Uh, the federal newborn screening program is still relatively young. Uh, as 
state on the last slide, uh, the original act was only passed in 2008. Uh, and so this National Academy of Medicine study would allow us to kind of view, take a look at the federal, the federal program and see ways that we can continue to move forward and continue to improve the program uh, as we move forward to the 21st century. Uh, and as with any bill, uh, it did increase authorization funding levels for these programs, uh, which is always important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here's just a timeline of, of kind of what happened. Uh, so as stated back in May, uh, it was originally re, uh, originally introduced. Uh, it did go through, had a subcommittee hearing, which was great, uh, went through markup, um, and it did eventually pass um, unanimously through the House, uh, which was great. Uh, simultaneously, there was an introduction uh, of a bill into the Senate. However, that bill uh, is currently stalled, uh, which we'll discuss a little more uh, in detail later. Um, Next slide, please. So as a result of the Senate not passing the bill, the authorization for federal support of new screening programs expired as of last September. Um, so next slide, please. So just a little bit of background on the advisory committee and, and kind of where it stands now. Uh, so the advisory committee was reopened as of March 20th uh, of this year. Following the lapse of authorization last September, the advisory committee had not been, uh, had not been meeting and uh, was not functioning as a sitting committee. Uh, and due to advocacy around the area uh, from both the patient advocacy organizations as well as um, Congressman and Congresswomen, the Secretary Azar used his authority to establish the advisory committee as a discretionary advisory committee, uh, which allows for the work of the committee to resume, including reviewing conditions to be added to the federal arrest. Uh, the committee was authorized for two years, uh, which is standard for discretionary advisory committees. Uh, just a little bit of information. Uh, it, in case you're interested, the advisory committee will be holding a webinar uh, Friday, May 15th at 10 a.m. Uh, this will be their first meeting this year. Uh, it should have been their second if they had been able to meet earlier. Um, however, oh, sorry about that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in addition, um, the, both the CDC and HRSA programs uh, were funded in the FY20 budget, uh, which we were excited about. Both did see uh, small increases over their FY19 budgets. Uh, an important note to make here, um, fair question to be asking at this point, would be why do we need to see this bill still pass? The advisory committee is sitting, the programs are funded, essentially the federal newborn training program is functioning as, as needed. Uh, and that is, all that, there is some truth to that. An important note to make is that the, within the reauthorization, there are improvements to these, to these programs. Uh, an example is the National Academy of Medicine study that I talked about previously. Um, but without the passage of the Reauthorization Act, we are staying in the status quo. And as we all know, we need to improve on the status quo. And so while we are very thankful I'm very happy that these programs are funded and running. Uh, we know that they're continuing to see improvement, and the only way we can see that happening, um, and w one of the ways that we can see that happening is through the passage of the Reauthorization Act. Uh, next slide, please. So back to the Senate uh, and kind of why it stalled out. Uh, so the Senate Health Committee has yet to hold a mark about the bill. Uh, this is due to Senator Rand Paul, especially for a change to the bill that require parents to opt in to allow for their newborns uh, unidentified dry blood spots to be used for research. Uh, this would create a huge burden for the program. Uh, these dry blood spots uh, are stripped of identifying information, uh, and once that occurs, laboratory staff um, and approved researchers may use these residual dry blood spots to improve screen tests for existing conditions. Um, these, dry, these dry blood spots are essential to newborn screening programs, both the current one as well as the future of the program. Uh, and so just for a little bit more information about that, um, I'll dive into it. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit on kind of the impact of this informed consent amendment. So current newborn screening, it affects the current newborn screening test. Uh, so to conduct rare disease research, the scientists require three to 10,000 unique samples to properly test the range of the test. So essentially what this means is that this newborn screening process is using various machines to, to test the dry blood spots uh, for, every, for every kid who goes through the program. Uh, and to ensure that these machines are working properly and to cut down on false positive and false negatives, 
the public health lab need a set of samples to ensure that they're producing the correct results. And so it is estimated that they need about three to 10,000 results. So losing the ability um, to have these dry blood spots, would we would lose the ability to ensure the machines are working properly, which would completely, uh, it, it would really complicate and hinder the program as, uh, as it currently functions. Uh, in addition, it would affect newborn screening research uh, and adding new conditions to the rust. So more than 70% of research published with these dry blood spots use the samples to develop new tools and treatments for disease not yet on the rust. Uh, researchers need these dry blood spots to conduct life-saving research to develop new treatments for the thousands of rare diseases still without a cure. And so these dry blood spots allow for new screening methods, new, new diagnostic methods, new treatments uh, for the variety of conditions still trying to get on uh, state newborn screening panels. So in terms of the effect of the informed consent on the state level, uh, we know that parents want to provide informed consent, uh, but this informed consent process would create a huge burden for the hospital. And so what this would occur in the sense of you have hospitals not even asking parents if they want to provide consent because it's too much of a burden. Uh, so we know this through a California study, um, only 52% of newborns were invited to participate in this study. Uh, however, 90% of patients, parents consented to participate, which indicates a willingness of parents to allow researchers to use their children's dry blood spots uh, for research. Uh, however, it's just a question of whether or not they're being asked. And so that is a key issue. And we also know that previous government action has acknowledged this and acknowledged the significant challenge of conducting research uh, with an informed consent being required. Um, and for any more information on that, uh, it, if you do visit the Every Life Foundation page and go to the newborn training page, we do have some information uh, on this. Uh, next slide, please. So next steps. Uh, so we're preparing for when Congress returns to test session. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, this is a little bit back burner uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, so we're currently working with the March of Dimes Coalition to prepare kind of a new set of fact sheets that bring together all the information needed to ensure that the Hill offices are properly educated, uh, such as the information just provided with informed consent. So we just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. There has been some misinformation going around, uh, and we want to ensure that everybody's uh, properly informed and properly knows what's going on. Uh, in addition, we're going to continue to work with the Senate Health Committee to determine equitable compromise. Um, as stated before, with funding in place for Hearst and CDC, as well as the opening of the Advisory Committee, uh, while we want to see uh, and need to see the passage of the Reauthorization Act, we, what we don't want to see is the passage of a Reauthorization Act that would hinder the development of the Federal Newborn Screening Program or hinder newborn screening program in general, such as the Informed Consent Amendment. So we want to continue to work with the Health Committee to kind of come to a compromise and figure out how we can get this bill passed. Uh, in addition, we want to continue grassroots advocacy, uh, continue to call on advocates to call on the email Senator Paul, as well as Chairman Lamar Alexander to voice the support of the bill without the informed consent amendment. And as always, we are examining all policy options. Um, we are looking ways through administrative action, appropriation report language, as well as public private partnerships to see, to bring about the improvement to the newborn screening program that the reauthorization actually trying to do. Uh, so we are continually trying to find a way to move this program forward and then move these policies forward. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to email me. Uh, I do not believe it's listed, but it's just uh, D. Simon at the everylifefoundation.org uh, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dylan. Um, next um, is Kylie um, on the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. Kylie? Um, hold on. Shannon, oh, can you hear me? To... Yes, now I can. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, as Shannon said, I'm Kylie Barber, the Medical Foods Policy Fellow at the National PKU Alliance in partnership with the Every Life Foundation. And I am going to go over the Medical Nutrition Equity Act today. Um, I'll start off talking about PKU, which is one of the conditions that is covered in the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. Um, so what is PKU? So it's a type of inborn error metabolism, or IEM for short, that is characterized by an insufficient amount or a complete lack of the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, 
which is responsible for metabolizing an essential amino acid in protein that's called phenylalanine, or FE for short. Um, FE is found in most everyday foods, including, including meat, breads, pastas. Um, there's even traces of FE found in fruits and vegetables, surprisingly enough. Uh, so what happens with, to somebody who has um, PKU is due to the lack of the phenylalanine hydroxylase, toxic levels of C accumulate in the blood as well as the brain, causing irreversible brain damage. Children suffer inadequate neurotransmitter synthesis, intellectual disability, and abnormal motor control, as well as behavior, um, struggling behavioral outcomes. Um, adults suffer significant neurological deterioration and severe mental health issues including severe depression and anxiety. So what is the treatment? Uh, medical nutrition, including a daily specialized formula and low protein modified foods, is the standard of care therapy for PKU and other IEMs and is essential to preventing these negative outcomes, these negative health outcomes that I mentioned before. Uh, next slide. Great. So what are medical foods? Um, they've been that they have been defined by the Orphan Drug Act, and you can find that definition on the lower left-hand um, corner of the screen. But for short, medical foods are designed for patients with limited or impaired capacity to ingest, digest, absorb, or metabolize ordinary foods and nutrients. Um, they generally come in three categories. Um, first, products in powder form or ready to, or ready to drink products that are devoid of the offending nutrients, but are otherwise nutritionally complete. The second are modular products that are not nutritionally complete, but they do serve to provide a component of the diet, um, again, without the offending nutrients, um, such as amino acid mixtures, low volume products, and tablets. And then the third category are foods that are modified to be low in protein, such as baked goods, pastas, meats and cheese substitutes that provide um, needed calories and satiety throughout the day. Uh, next slide. So the out-of-pocket costs of medical food depend on the individual's age, the disorder, and insurance coverage status. The estimated annual cost for treating a person with an IEM ranges from about $2,200 for an infant a year to almost $25,000 for a man or pregnant woman. The products vary in cost depending on the amount needed to feed an individual and, again, the type of condition that's being treated. Um, the formula ranges between $300 to over $500 per six case um, packet. And typically, you know, depending on the severity and once again, the condition, somebody can go through a canister um, about every day and a half. So it adds up very, very quickly throughout the month. And additionally, low protein modified foods cost up to about eight times the cost of normal groceries. And once again, you cannot find these in um, local grocery stores. They have to be ordered out through a manufacturer. Um, as I've uh, written on the lower, lower half of the slide, um, a loaf of bread, you know, generally costs about $2. Um, for a low protein modified loaf of bread, it costs about $14. Um, so quite, uh, quite the expense for these families on top of all the normal, um, normal costs that, require, um, that are required to, to have a family. Um, thanks, next slide. Okay, so really the issue is that People with PKU and other inborn errors of metabolism <clears throat> and certain digestive conditions, when they're diagnosed, a you know it's it's devastating to have this type of rare disease diagnosis. And B, as they go throughout um, finding insurance coverage, a lot of these patients find that insurance companies refuse to pay for their first frontline treatment that their doctor has recommended. So up until about 1972, medical foods were regulated as drugs by the FDA. Uh, manufacturers were subject to onerous requirements that were extremely time consuming and cost restrictive, which choked the life out of um, innovation for these medical food products. 
1972, the FDA reclassified these products to foods for special dietary use to enhance their development and availability. Um, because medical foods are regulated as foods and not drugs, <clears throat> they may be referred to as over-the-counter. However, in most cases, authorization is required by the pharmacy, company, or organization that dispenses the product to demonstrate that a doctor is indeed supervising the administration of these products. Um, so as of 2016, there are about 35 states that have passed some sort of legislative mandate for um, state or private payer coverage of medical foods. This coverage mandated on a state by state basis does not apply to those who are self-insured or where state law does not, uh, is not applicable, for instance, federal plans. Um, in addition, there's wide variability in coverage from state to state. Payment for medical foods may occur through programs administered by states such as Medicaid, CHIP, and WIC. Um, there's also coverage by private insurance, um, although once again, this is very variable and um, very, um, does not meet the needs of the patient. I'll put it that way. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to briefly discuss um, the impact of the COVID-19 on the IMD community. Um, Sarah Chamberlain, who is the executive director of National PKU News and co-founder of How Much Fee, designed and distributed a survey to seven participating IMD organizations inquiring about the impact of COVID-19 on the IMD community. During phase one, the survey found that the pandemic hasn't had a significantly um, a negative impact on the IMD population <clears throat> that is different from the general population. So this is promising news, um, although medical food coverage still remains an issue even, even in normal times. Um, one key data point that I wanted to highlight is about 25% of the community believes that they're at risk of losing insurance coverage, um, mainly employer-provided coverage that covers their metabolic formula um, and or their low protein modified foods. And this is a key point that reiterates the critical necessity of the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. Um, additional findings from the survey will be um, distributed and Sarah will put together a complete survey review um, that will be shared in the upcoming week. So the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, uh, the purpose of the Medical Nutrition Equity Act is to provide for the coverage of medically necessary food and vitamins and individual amino acids for digestive and inherited metabolic disorders under federal health programs and private health insurance. Um, the House bill, which is HR 2501, currently has 62 co-sponsors, which we are very excited about. <clears throat> Every month we are seeing growth in this area. Our latest, <clears throat> excuse me, our latest additions, um, just this past month in April, Congressman Drew Ferguson from Georgia, Congresswoman Betty McCollum from Minnesota. Um, Senator Ernst has agreed to be the Senate Republican lead. We are very excited about that. Um, we are holding on this bill um, to reintroduce it because we are trying to recruit a couple more original co-sponsors um, <clears throat> to sign on, um, and we project the reintroduction sometime within the next month or so, so keep an eye on that to see when that bill drops. Um, next slide, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so for those of you who are interested in this issue and are looking to advocate with us, we are looking to recruit, once again, additional original co-sponsors for the Senate bill. Um, as much support we can get on that bill before it drops, <clears throat> the better. So we are asking advocates to reach out to Senators Cassidy, Young, and Blackburn and request that they sign on as original co-sponsors to the Senate bill. Um, we are also asking advocates to continue to push in the House and encourage advocates to send messages to their representatives and urge them to sign on as co-sponsor of HR 2501. Um, we make it really easy for you. You can just go to nutritionequity.org and click the contact your members of Congress link. And you can easily just send, fill out a couple um, information fields and then it will send a message to your representative. Um, for any questions, you can find my email at the 
on the last bullet of the slide, it's kbarber at everylifefoundation.org. And that is all. Thanks, Kylie. Um, and next we have Becky Abbott on the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. Hello, advocates. Uh, happy Thursday. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. Um, my name is Becky Abbott, and I'm the manager of treatment and research for the National Foundation for Ectodermal Dysplasias. And I just wanted to share a little bit of information about the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act, which is um, uh, federal legislation that um, the NFED and 40 other organizations are working on to try to move forward through the 116th Congress. Um, so just a little bit of background, the um, Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act would ensure that um, any individual who is born with a congenital anomaly um, would receive medical insurance coverage for the repair of their congenital anomaly as long as that uh, repair is medically necessary. Um, for the first slide, um, I just want to mention quickly that one in 33 babies in the United States is born with a congenital anomaly. Um, and then of those 120,000 children born annually with birth defects will require, um, 40,000 of them will re require reconstructive surgery. Examples of um, congenital anomalies are cleft lip, cleft palate, skin lesions, vascular, anomaly, vascular anomalies, um, malformations of the ear, hand, and foot, and then also other craniofacial um, deformities uh, for individuals born with ectodermal dysplasias. Um, that includes either several missing teeth or um, being born with no teeth at all. And um, although there's many different um, medical professionals and surgeons that can provide services, often the services are labeled as uh, cosmetic or unnecessary. So the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act would ensure that all private group and individual health policies cover any medically necessary treatments um, including needed dental procedures to repair all congenital anomalies. So we're asking that all congenital anomalies be treated equally and that um, just because a deformity is uh, craniofacial in nature that um, insurance companies cannot use loopholes to deny coverage. It would, um, of course, like I said, make sure or, um, that it was medically necessary to achieve normal bodily function or appearance, and then also clarifies um, that this includes uh, dental, orthodontic, and prosthodontic support. It excludes cosmetic procedures and then also cosmetic surgeries. Next slide. Uh, so right now we have Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin and Joni Ernst from Iowa as our uh, Senate leads, and we currently have 40 Senate co-sponsors. The Senate bill is S-560. And also in the House, we have Representative Colin Peterson from Minnesota and Denver Riggleman for, from Virginia. Uh, the House bill is H.R. 1379, and we currently have 301 House co-sponsors. We have strong bipartisan support in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. And the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act was reintroduced on 226 of 19 during Rare Disease Week. Um, like I'd mentioned before, that this bill is broad in scope. It includes all congenital anomalies, and it is not disease specific. So while the um, NFED advocates for families with ectodermal dysplasias, there are approximately 40 other organizations who advocate for this bill as well because it does include all congenital anomalies. On 1-8 of this year, the Energy and Commerce Committee um, subcommittee held a hearing, and on 1-28, the Education and Labor uh, subcommittee held a hearing on ELSA. On 2-26, the bill was placed on the House consensus calendar, and then on 3-11, the Energy and Commerce subcommittee did hold a markup, and um, of course, with uh, all of the coronavirus um, issues that came up. Now we are just waiting for Energy and Commerce to hold a full committee markup on the bill as it did pass through subcommittee. Next slide. So we have a couple of calls to action and uh, we're asking all organizations to participate. Um, as I said, currently ELSA has over 40 uh, supporters and we're asking all patient organizations to sign on to a letter of support. Um, and I have a link there if you're interested in doing that. We're also asking if any groups um, are having virtual meetings uh, with their legislators 
or um, emailing that you ask them to co-sponsor the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. We also have a Facebook group called the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act um, Advocates Facebook group where you can join to learn more about this legislation and how you can help um, with our advocacy initiatives. And then we're also asking patient advocacy organizations and individuals to register as an advocate for ELSA um, just to get updates on the progression of the bill and find out um, what our next advocacy initiatives are going to be. Next slide. So we need your help, um, like I had mentioned before. And um, if you would like to reach out to me and check the list of co-sponsors that we have currently, I'd be happy to send you that information. You can also check that on congress.gov if you enter in either the Senate um, or House bill numbers. If you need contact information um, to email or call your congressional staffers, feel free to reach out to me. Or if you want to uh, learn further information about the Ensuring Lasting, Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act, please reach out to me as well. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention we will be um, trying to continue to move this bill forward and we're hoping to um, garner additional support and success. So we just really um, ask that if you are reaching out to your legislators just to mention um, the bill and ask for continued support. And um, just wanted to leave you with um, when you're reaching out to your legislators and staff, um, as you can imagine, we're all under a lot of stress and um, I'm sure they're in a stressful situation too, having to work remotely. So um, just be, be kind and remember that they're going through a lot as well and um, just ask them how their day is going or how they're doing through all of this as well. Um, but thank you, Shannon. Thank you, RDLA, as always, for putting this together and um, look forward to the next webinar next month. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Um, next, we have Eric, um, who's going to talk a little bit about the legislative packages um, that have been passed on COVID-19. Eric? Great. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so I know we're a little behind time, so I'm going to try to go pretty quickly through the background slides and then um, kind of give folks an update of sort of where the state of play is now. Um, the sort of one thing I'll mention from the patient advocacy community is we're sort of fighting this battle on two fronts. Um, one, obviously, the impact on people with chronic diseases and disabilities is uh, being felt in a number of ways, uh, both in terms of those who um, are more susceptible to serious conditions, or serious cases of COVID-19, um, but also trying to um, maintain continuity of care in the disrupted uh, healthcare field. Um, and the second is, um, as our members are nonprofit patient advocacy organizations, we know that all of you have been um, impacted from a financial standpoint as well. So um, as we have a lot more demand for our services, we know um, many members are um, having to cancel or postpone or, or change their fundraisers and things of that nature. So we've been kind of looking at it from an economic stimulus standpoint as well. Um, so just real quickly, um, we are um, about to pass today the fourth round of COVID legislation. Um, on this slide, you see the first two that went through um, over the last few months or so. Um, first was HR 6074, um, and then the second was HR 6201, the Families First uh, Response Act. So these first two um, were very much geared towards um, some uh, very quick um, emergency appropriations to help fight the pandemic. Um, also included uh, telehealth waivers. Um, uh, the second bill had a, a lot of focus on allowing people to social distance. So um, things such as uh, paid um, FMLA leave and sick leave um, to ensure that people can stay home um, if they need to, um, as well as um, adding some, uh, some very needed um, financial resources to the Medicaid programs. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so the really big one that a lot of people have been focused on was the CARES Act, which was passed uh, about a month ago um, that really focused in on a number of areas to help stabilize the economy. Um, the, um, uh, a lot of uh, funding given to unemployment, um, the small business loan package, which I'll talk about, um, looking at, at funds for um, health care providers, um, direct payments, which I'm sure a lot of folks are aware of, up to $1,200 to individuals. Um, and then finally, um, delaying the tax filing deadline until July 15th. Um, if we go to the next slide, 
Um, so one thing as I mentioned that we've really been focused in on is uh, ensuring um, that nonprofit organizations can uh, weather this storm as well as possible. Um, one sort of overarching thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I, I think the nonprofit community really needs to um, stand up and um, applaud themselves a little bit. You know, this is the first time um, certainly that in my time working in this field, I believe ever that nonprofits have been included in the type of stimulus that's being um, pushed here. So I'm certainly really happy to see that uh, Congress has been listening to the nonprofit community um, as we talk about how important this is um, to, to make sure that we're able to um, weather the storm. Um, a couple of things that were included in the CARES Act, um, I mentioned the small business uh, loans, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program um, does allow for nonprofits, 501c3s to participate, uh, which is the first time we've ever seen that. So that's um, been a great thing to see, um, but obviously as folks know, um, quickly ran out of money. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. Um, the second thing that people should be aware of is that included in the CARES Act, people who take the standard deduction um, in 2020 can um, uh, deduct up to $300 of charitable donations. I don't think this has been very well um, communicated to the general public, so certainly think this is something that um, you all should be making sure that your um, individual donors are aware of. Obviously, I think this is a, a good opportunity to help um, infuse some much needed uh, revenue into nonprofits. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so where are we now? Um, so a couple of things that we're looking for in the nonprofit community um, is uh, uh, really expanding upon what's in the CARES Act. Um, we've been calling within the nonprofit community to uh, create a um, sub separate line item for nonprofits in the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, so really making sure that we are um, prioritized as part of this effort. Um, the second is to strengthen that uh, charitable giving incentive that I mentioned um, by uh, both raising the amount above $300 uh, and then also uh, making it applicable to 2019 returns. So if people have a little bit more time to get in their returns, we think that um, having uh, an incentive to give um, before they file those can help get some money in uh, to nonprofit coffers now. Um, and then also really looking again on the, the sort of public health perspective front. If we go to the next slide, I can kind of walk through um, real quickly there. Um, so we've been uh, working with our uh, partners in the Partnership to Protect Coverage, which is a coalition of patient advocacy organizations really looking to push for um, some much needed um, public health provisions to be included in these conversations. Um, one, really making sure that people can um, get enrolled in insurance that don't currently have it. Um, uh, whether that be through uh, the marketplaces or through Medicaid. Um, so a lot of things that we're calling for in terms of stabilizing Medicaid programs. Um, we would like to see um, required coverage for testing, treatment, and vaccines uh, for COVID-19 um, and uh, increasing a better coverage of telemedicine as well. Um, one thing that we certainly want to see is with any of these things that we already expect um, payers to be taking on a huge chunk of costs to um, help treat COVID-19 um, and we're, as we're calling for more coverage of it. Um, one thing that we certainly want to continue to message to Congress is that we need to make sure that um, there's additional funding going to the payers as well because we expect that without that, we may see some uh, pretty serious jumps in uh, premiums and probably higher deductibles and cost sharing. So um, anything that we do here and just anything that the, um, the costs from the virus uh, have an impact, we know are going to have a, an impact on premiums. So I want to make sure that we're uh, mitigating that as much as possible. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, so I'm sort of fresh off the presses. Of course, I sent these slides in two days ago and it's our, they're already out of date. Um, just a, a quick update on where we are. Um, the House is expected to send um, a new bill to the President's desk this afternoon. Um, this is what we're kind of terming as CARES 1.5, not quite CARES 2.0. And I say that because I think a lot of things that we're, we've been asking for um, are not included, but we think that there will be um, at least one more uh, round of negotiations this spring. Um, so what we see going to the president this afternoon um, is another $320 billion um, for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, one thing to be aware of, if your um, organization put in for funds and did not receive them before the funds were depleted, 
um, at least what we've been hearing from most folks is that um, banks will honor those applications um, and you'll be in the queue. Um, I would certainly recommend to reach out to your banks now to make sure that's the way that they're handling it. But most of from what we've heard is that that is um, how most of them are doing it. Um, also, an additional 60 billion for the economic injury disaster loan program. Um, another 75 billion for hospitals and 25 billion um, for testing. 11 billion of which will go to the states to implement their own testing strategies. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, just sort of one final closing note. Um, again, there are certainly more opportunities to keep pushing for um, protections of, of uh, people with chronic uh, diseases and disabilities, as well as nonprofits. Um, but I think we also need to kind of um, take a pause and celebrate the success that we've had so far. Um, and certainly um, wish you all the best of luck and hope everyone is staying health and, uh, healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, so last but not least, I'm just going to do a quick run through and let you all know about Rare Across America. Um, you may have heard a little bit about this last year um, before the summer, but um, last year in 2019 and during the August recess, we had over 300 meetings um, with members of Congress with over 600 attendees in the state and local offices during Rare Across America. And these are some of the pictures from these, these meetings that, um, that happened last year. Um, what is Rare Across America? Rare Across America is an opportunity for advocates to meet with their federal legislators close to home in the local district and state offices with their representatives and senators. Um, and it's for new and veteran advocates. Um, RDLA schedules the meetings for advocates in the district offices of their representatives and senators. And you can attend one meeting, two, or all three. Um, and this is a great opportunity for those who aren't able to travel to Washington, D.C., um, like during Rare Disease Week or other fly-ins, to meet with your members of Congress. Um, and you might be thinking about whether um, in-person meetings will actually be happening in August. And um, we are keeping our fingers crossed and remaining um, optimistic, but we also do have um, a backup plan of having virtual meetings um, take the place of in-person meetings. So, um, so that will not stop um, the program from happening um, and being able to speak with our legislators on really important issues that face our community. Um, but new advocates can start relationships with their legislators or veteran advocates can continue to build their relationships with these meetings. Um, so these are the important dates related to Rare Across America. Um, registration will open on May 4th through July 3rd. Um, registration is needed for us to know um, who wants to participate in meetings and who to schedule those meetings with. And um, we will host an informational webinar on July 9th and that um, you will learn more about how we're scheduling the meetings, what to expect in the meetings, um, and what the legislative asks um, will be. Um, and then on July 14th, we are hoping to have a new webinar on social media and how to utilize social media during these meetings. Everyone was so great last year about posting about their meetings and um, posting their pictures on Facebook and Twitter. And so we just wanted to um, give everyone more tools to share more about their meetings um, through social media. Um, and then the meetings will actually take place uh, between August 3rd and September 6th. And on the registration, you will be able to um, let us know which dates you're not available for meetings um, so that we can schedule the meetings um, according to your schedules. Um, and more information can be found at rareacrossamerica.org. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is sbonfelden at everylifefoundation.org. And our next RDLA monthly webinar will be held on May 21st at noon Eastern. And if you, there are any topics you'd like to speak on or would like presented on the webinar, please let me know. Um, our agendas are open and um, we would love to hear any ideas on topics that you might have. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today. 
um, and taking time out of your schedules and for bearing with us as we ran a little bit long today. There is a lot happening and everyone is working, working so hard. Um, it's great to see even during these challenging times. So um, thank you so much and please do not hesitate to reach out to me or anyone on the Every Life team if there is anything um, we can do to support you and your advocacy efforts. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.